really leading us in prayer for the church and uh, really encouraged to see that. You know, today obviously is a solemn day. I'm sure you've heard by now of the Malaysian Airlines disaster. Uh, on Friday evening, I guess late Friday evening, I read the news, a uh, plane carrying uh, 227 passengers, including five children under the age of uh, five, 12 crew members total. It disappeared somewhere over the Gulf of Thailand there, right? Uh, uh, over on the route from Kuala Lumpur until to Beijing, it, the, the plane just disappeared out of nowhere, right? No one knows what happened to the plane. Uh, no one knows why no distress signal was sent out. No one knows exactly who was on board. The search goes on. They're saying it might take a very long time, right? Long time to find the plane, wherever they, uh, the, the, the survivors are, who knows, uh, uh, by now, uh, doesn't look good. This could be the deadliest aviation incident, they say, since 2001, when actually the American Airlines are right here. Uh, it crashed in Bell Harbor, Queens, uh, after taking off from JFK. Uh, uh, so I think like 250 passengers have died there. You can imagine right now, in this moment, right? In China and Thailand and all, all, all over the Southeast Asia, the grief that these family members are experiencing, right? You, you're just expecting, these days, a flight, you go on a flight, you expect them to come safely and you welcome them. And I, I've been reading all these stories about uh, these members who are grieving, just panicking in shock of their a possible loss of their loved one. One such family member is this uh, woman named uh, Sandra Woods from Texas. She has a, uh, she ha her, her son, Philip Wood, he was, uh, I guess, the lone uh, American adult on that plane. He was, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, working for IBM in, in, uh, in Malaysia there. And, and today, um, I, I was reading an article that, that Sandra, she shared um, how excited she was initially when, when she found out that her son uh, would move to, uh, from Beijing to Malaysia for her job, uh, for his job in IBM. Uh, today, she shares to the press, uh, she says, you want to know how it feels to lose a son at the age of 50? You want to know how it feels? She says it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating, right? But one thing uh, she shared, uh, which really caught my eye in this article, she said that, I know in my heart, though, that Philip, that he's with God, she said. I know in my heart, deep down in her heart, that her son Philip is with God. She says she's trying to get through the trauma, and she says this, that only people who know God can survive things like this. Only people who truly know and experience and understand who God is can, can go through something like this, a mother losing her child that's the greatest tragedy you can have on right of a parent losing their children before they go she's praying still for her son philip she's praying and the present uh, there's this company a texas-based company that lost 20 of its employees on that flight there was 20 employees on that flight um, and the president of this company said our thoughts and prayers are with those affected right by this tragic event you hear that a lot don't we um, Whenever these tragedies come, whenever these you know, devastating uh, uh, events, uh, we hear that a lot. You know, when someone passes, of course, we say our thoughts and prayers are with you, right? How often do we say that, right? Our thoughts and prayers are with you. I think sometimes we just say that though, out of like just just convenience, right? Or out of just just try to be polite. You know, yeah, my thoughts and prayers are with you. And what else do we know how to say in a, in, a, in a card sometimes, right? Well, you know, let's put it to action here. I want us to start. Uh, by really remembering and, and, and praying for the victims here, um, all the 227 victims and all their family members overseas that are grieving, let's not just have our thoughts and prayers with them, Let, let's actually have a moment of prayer. I wanna just maybe for a minute or so lift up a prayer for them, for God just to provide them comfort and peace and some kind of understanding through this uh, tragedy that uh, our prayers are heard and they will be heard by God. And let's go to God in prayer, lift it up real quick, would you? Uh, have a moment of prayer for the families, mothers who have lost their son, fathers who have lost their wives, children who have lost their parents, sisters and brothers. Can't ever imagine that happening to us. Let's pray for them. Let's pray, Father, would you be with them, comfort them.
Father, we don't know any of the uh, 227 passengers personally. We don't know these five children. We don't know uh, Sandra and her son, Philip Wood. We don't know any of these people, but Father, our heart goes out to them, and we want to pray for them now. We want to pray, Father, as you are the God of all comfort. Would you comfort the families who are grieving, Lord? They need you, and we know that you know that. Father, would you give them some kind of peace, some sense of assurance through this time of tragedy? Would you heal their broken hearts as they grieve their lost ones, especially for parents who have lost their children, children who have lost their parents, Father? Would you minister to them? Would you ultimately let them know, as you say in Romans 8, 28, in all things you cause everything to work together for your good, for the good of those who are called according to your good purpose, Father. You make all things good. And Father, we believe that through this tragedy, you will bring about good. We trust and pray that in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Prayer. This is a season of prayer. We're praying, and, and, and I'm glad that uh, our passage uh, here focuses on uh, prayer, we spoke uh, about that last week. It's a very similar passage, right? It's a different, uh, uh, just a gospel uh, today. But it's a battlefield of prayer we talked about. I shared last week how we can start to get very comfortable in life. When things especially are going well, when things are just going too smoothly, we, we start to feel good about ourselves, and then we get overconfident in ourselves. And then the next thing you know, one of, always, one of two things always happens. I, I share that. In my personal life, I've seen it in so many people's lives here at church. One of two things always seem to happen when things just go so smoothly, when things are going really well. Either one, God's going to bring a test, right? He's going to bring a test in your life to challenge your faith, to really make sure that your faith is not just dependent on, on the, you just living good and having everything good happen to you. He's going to make sure that it's a real faith. He's going to make sure that it, it's, it's a faith that's mature to the very end. So he's going to bring some tests and maybe challenges in your life. Or the second thing that possibly happens is Satan, the enemy, he actually brings a, tr uh, a temptation, okay? It's not a test or trial, but he actually brings a temptation because he's trying to bring you down, right? He sees that God's working in you. He's doing something good in your life. And so he's trying to do whatever he can, uh, some hardship or whatever, to try to bring your faith down, okay? So those are the two things that I've always seen happen. After the message last week, we talked about these attacks, and so many of you came up to me and shared, Pastor Peter, you know, that message really spoke because I'm going through an attack right now. I'm going through an attack in my life. Something's happening at my job place right now. I'm getting attacked by my boss and my coworkers. Some of you assured that, hey, there's attacks happening at the home. Um, there's a lot of rife, strife between uh, marriages, so, some, some, some strife between relationships there. A lot of things going on, a lot of attacks. I wasn't surprised to hear that because I said that when things are going well, and I see a lot of you are committing to growing in your faith this year, when that's happening, attacks are going to come in your life. Satan doesn't like it one bit, right? So it's not a surprise at all to me. In fact, I'm more concerned about you guys, those of you who are not under any attack. I'm more concerned about some of you here who are just really just not having any issues in life. The thing is going so smoothly that there's nothing to complain about, no worries. That's who I'd be more concerned about. Because uh, for those of you people uh, who are just coasting right now, saying maybe you'd be thinking, hey, you know, you guys, I don't need to worry about you. I don't need to worry about anything in your life. God's obviously not doing anything in your life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on those people that God's actually working on, okay? So I'd be more worried, actually, if there's nothing going on in your life. I'd be more worried if there's no attacks. But when, when these attacks come, though, it's not pleasant, is it, right? We see these attacks coming. And I said last week, we need to be prepared for these attacks. We need to be prepared, okay? The way do we get prepared is to go on the battlefield, right? That battlefield is prayer we talked about. That's where victory is either won or lost on the battlefield of prayer. How opportune that we've just begun a season of prayer, okay? The season of Lent. You've heard of that term before, Lent. It started this past Wednesday. Started praise and prayer night here at QPEM uh, with Ash Wednesday here at church. It's the beginning of 40 days, 40 days of preparation leading up to Resurrection Sunday and Easter. It's 40 days where we devote to really just praying, praying a, a more of a repentant prayer, just really confessing uh, our, our sin and, and really preparing our hearts for the ultimate celebration that awaits us 40 days from now on Easter Resurrection Sunday. But it's an important time of self-reflection on, on our, our sin and our need for God's grace. And, and that's what we're in right now, in the season of Lent, this, uh, tomorrow, actually, we're starting uh, uh, early morning prayers at 6 a.m. here at church, right, for 40 days straight. I encourage you guys to uh, join with me. I'm, gonna, I'm, uh, I'm committing to this 40 days straight 
It's going to be rough. I already, I already told Kathy, it is going to be rough. It is going to be brutal. Uh, Caleb's going to uh, you know, wake me up at 4 in the morning, and then I'm going to have to uh, go to the church and pray and then come back home and try to watch. It's going to be a rough 40 days physically. But I'm excited for it. I'm really excited for it because we need that. We need to be preparing for the battlefield, right? I encourage if you want to you know, commit to it, talk to me, and maybe you know, we'll keep each other accountable through the next 40 days as well. But we need to pray, right? Last week's point was that to pray, we actually need to get on the battlefield, okay? We actually need to get on the battlefield of prayer. Stop standing on the sidelines. Stop snoozing like the disciples were doing here in the pastor. Stop sleeping away. Get on the battlefield. Get up. Go out to battle. Let's pray. And many of you have committed to doing that, okay? But some of us here, we're committing to pray more, but we don't know quite what to do. <laughs> when we're out on the battlefield, right? Okay, fine. Pastor, I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to join you on the battlefield. But when I'm on battle, I don't know what to do, right? We have all these weapons that God's given us, uh, the, sword, the sword of truth. Uh, we have the shield of faith. We have the armor of God. We have all these weapons. We don't know what to do with it, right? We don't know what to do with all this, okay? We're just thrown out of the battle. And we're kind of like these novice noobs that we don't even know what to do here. What am I to do? Well, today we're going to look at the greatest teacher there was. The greatest teacher that ever lived, Jesus Christ. We're going to see what he did when he went on the battlefield, okay? Last week, we've kind of focused on the disciples a bit, on what they did. Today, we're going to focus on what Jesus does on the battlefield in the prayer of Gethsemane. There's no greater way, is there, for us to learn <laughs> how to pray than to watch and observe from the greatest teacher there was, right? Today, we're going to learn how to respond when we're under attack by the enemy. We're going to see how Jesus responds through his, his example. We're going to learn very clearly what we must do to get through and conquer life's greatest tests and challenges to our faith, especially on the battlefield of prayer. So turn with me here. Mark chapter 14, verse, starting in verse 32, right? Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 32. It's a parallel passage to what we studied last week in Matthew. Okay, remember the Gospels? It's written by four different authors, okay, four different perspectives, but they're all telling the same account, okay? So this is Mark's perspective here. It's right after uh, the Last Supper, just before Jesus is arrested, taken to the cross, the disciples here, we see they're, they've been losing the battle, right? They've been losing their battle. Why? Because they're on the sidelines. They're sleeping. They're resting away, right? The enemy's about to attack, and Jesus knows what he has to do, right? Jesus knows what must be done. He goes into the garden. He prays the most intense prayer we could possibly imagine. He struggles and wrestles with prayer. We said even to the point of he, literally his sweats from his brow is turning to blood, okay? That's how intense his prayer is. Satan's tormenting him here, okay? Right, we've seen all this, that movie, Passion of the Christ. Remember that scene where Jesus is in the garden? And Satan, that serpent, he's tormenting him. And Jesus is just being tormented. He's wrestling, but he's praying this intense prayer. And through this prayer, Jesus, his heart and mind is given to the Father right there. And victory is won, right? We saw that last week. Victory is won. Today we're going to see how that victory is won. Look at Jesus' prayer. We're going to look at his prayer. We know the prayer that he taught to his disciples, right? So it's the Lord's Prayer, right? We're familiar with that. We've been learning that, especially praise and prayer nights, right? The Lord's Prayer. Uh, and, you know, Deacon uh, Ed, he began uh, his intercessor prayer with the, the Lord's Prayer, didn't he? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? We know that. But Jesus here teaches um, us a portion of the Lord's Prayer right here in the prayer of Gethsemane. There's one part he keys on, he focuses on in the Lord's Prayer right here. And this is a section of the Lord's Prayer that we don't really understand too well, I think. He says the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Remember that part, right, in our Lord's Prayer? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I've always wondered, have you ever wondered what, what, what this is saying here? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I think many of us misunderstand what Jesus is saying. Because so many of us, we think that, Father, we're praying to you. Father, would you lead us not into temptation? Keep us, le Father, lead us not into temptation today. That, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Because God doesn't bring temptation in our lives. That's why. Right? If you think about it, like I said before, God never tempts his people. Okay? God doesn't ever bring a temptation into your life to entice you to sin, obviously, right? He would never do that. So why are we praying this, lead us not into temptation then? I think it's a misunderstanding there. Remember, temptation always comes from the enemy, right? 
temptations are always coming from Satan. It never comes from God. So a better way to translate this, and the way, way I try to uh, pray this when I'm praying is, is not lead us not into temptation, but rather pray it this way. And Father, would you deliver us from the evil one so that we may not be led into temptation? Right? See what I'm saying? Father, would you lead us then not into temptation? Deliver us from the evil one, see? Deliver us from the evil one who is trying to tempt us. Deliver us from him so that we may not be led into temptation. See, this is what Jesus is saying here. This is what Jesus is praying right here in Gethsemane. He's praying, Father, deliver us from the enemy. Deliver us so that we may not be led into the enemy's temptation. Yeah. There's three things I want us to look at specifically at Jesus' prayer. Three things that are so important for us to grasp, to implement on the battlefield when we're out there to pray. There's very three things. The first thing I want us to see is this. In verse 36, look at how Jesus starts his prayer. Verse 36. In Mark, Mark chapter uh, uh, 14, verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, he says. Take this cup from me. Isn't it incredible how he starts his prayer? Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. This has to sound strange to us listening. Yeah. This has to sound very disturbing, maybe, to some of us here. We have to be wondering what's going on. Why is Jesus asking God to take this cup from me? This is Jesus Christ we're talking about, right? This is God himself. Why is he asking God to take this cup away? We have to understand then first what this cup is about, don't we? What is Jesus asking God for this cup to be taken away? A lot of us think that it's just, oh, Father, take this cup. I don't want to face death. You know, I don't want to experience death. That's not it at all, right? That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus knows very, uh, very clearly. We know that Jesus is not afraid to die, right? Jesus is very clearly not to die. His courage is not in question there. So it's not about whether he, he's afraid of death or not, okay? It's also not about the fact that he's shameful of, of death or what the, uh, the death brings, the mocking, the breeding, the, the, cor the crown of the thorns. It's not the spitting, the insults uh, the, that's going to be going into God's precious, uh, 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 his ears there. That's not what he's uh, afraid of either, is it? He, he goes into that. We know from uh, Philippians 2 that the greatest shame uh, actually is, 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 is God humbling himself to become man, right? <laughs> so Jesus is, is humble to the ultimate extent, right? So it's not the shame that comes with death. He endures a cross despite the shame. We know that, right? It's also not this pain that he's afraid of. Obviously, the most painful, gruesome, uh, just horrendous death that any possible person could ever endure. We know that it's not the, the, the physical pain that he's, he's uh, uh, you know, uh, afraid of or he's not uh, willing to take. I mean, people, Christians, and martyrs have, have endured that for 2,000 years, right? Tortures, painful deaths in the name of Christ, right? So we know that. That's not what Jesus is talking about. So what is it then in this cup? one theologian, yeah, I love what he says. He says, Jesus sees himself in this cup. Jesus sees himself being made into sin. See? In this cup, okay, Jesus sees himself, the pure and spotless Lamb of God, being made into sin, and he feels repulsed by that. He feels repulsion. The Almighty God, the Father, is placing all of mankind's sin on Jesus, this pure, precious, entirely righteous. And he looks into this cup, and he sees himself being made into sin, the object of God's wrath, you see? The object of God's wrath. Jesus, up to this point, he has a pure, righteous, unified relationship with God beyond any of us could comprehend. They've never been ever in disagreement or in conflict in the Trinity, perfect in unity. And now in this cup, Jesus sees for the first time separation from the Father, right? I've talked about that before, right? For the first time ever in the history, separation from the Father as Jesus is made the object of his Father's wrath, sin, and he feels rejection. Okay? The cup is God's wrath against sin our sin, right? All of our sin. It's in that cup. And it's all to come upon 
Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you envision that? Can you imagine what, what he's going through? I can't. We can never comprehend fully, okay? God himself being separated from God, his own entity being separated from himself, it makes no sense to us. It cannot be comprehended through our human minds, okay? He has to separate himself because he becomes sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin, we know that. So Jesus becomes sin, and the grief of anticipating that brings him to such a point of sorrow. In Mark chapter 14, verse 34 and 34, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, right, he says. It's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So he pleads with God for another way. He pleads with God for another way. For deliverance, he's pleading for. Deliverance, right? And this is the prayer I think most of us are used to. You know, many of us, when, when we're facing our own dreadful cup, when we see uh, uh, the crisis coming to our life, we go to God in prayer. It's usually during times of crisis, right, in our lives, where we actually go to pray, don't we? You know, most of the time we don't really pray, but when something goes wrong, something goes bad, something we're in need, we go to Him in prayer. Even tragedies like this Malaysian Airlines uh, disaster, even these kind of tragedies, it brings the world to prayer, right? It brings even non-believers to prayer, right? How many people remember after 9-11, we see the, un the nation come together in prayer. Isn't that astounding? Even non-believers, people that have never prayed before, they go to God to pray, cry out for his mercy. Save us, Father. Save us. Help us. How many times have we done that, right? How many times have you cried out to God? How many times has he saved us through prayer? I recall stories that you QPAM members have shared with me. I remember all the times that you've shared how you've cried out to God and how he's answered you. This one sister, I'm not going to say her name here, but and she was telling me, Pastor Peter, you know, I was really, really in a bad situation financially. Like, like literally, I, 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 had, I had like maybe 10, 15 bucks in, in my bank account. She was looking for work. She was out of work, struggling. Her rent payment was due literally in two weeks. Her rent payment's due. She had never missed her rent payment once in her entire life. And here, what can she do? She's looking for a job. She's trying her best to find a job. She's find some other odd end job she's done it before. But she's she, she's, she's going to be, be defaulting in her, in her rent and, and possibly uh, be evicted. She's asking, what, what, what can she do? She goes to pray. And she tells me, she prays. She cried out to God. She cried, pleading, God, help me. I don't know what to do, she says. I don't know what else I can do. I just, I need your help somehow. I need a miracle. And she prayed, and she tells me, literally, that next day, she gets an envelope in the mail, and she opens it up, and it's, it's this check from a, a work that she did a, a couple months ago that she forgot about, some other project she did, and she gets this check in the mail just enough to cover her rent payment. I, I'm not making this stuff up. I can't make this stuff up. Literally, she gets it that day. She deposited it, pays her rent. She's good to go, and then now she, this, this is her. She's found a job. She's you know, back on her feet. Um, you hear these stories countless times, right? It's not coincidence. It's not just, you know, just, just making this up. I mean, how many times we prayed, right? Where we cry out to God in a desperate dire situation. I shared about my grandmother, remember? She's not, she was 94 years old. 94 years old, and she went to the hospital twice for pneumonia. The second time she went, remember, she, she not just had pneumonia, she had a blood clot, clot in her leg, bleeding from her heart. Uh, 94 years old, that, that's pretty much the end. And the doctors share that with us, remember? The doctors made it very clear, prepare, prepare for the funeral, prepare for the, the, the funeral arrangements and everything. And, and we prayed, got together and prayed. We cried out, Father, if it is not your time yet, Father, would you save her? There's certain things still that the family needs to just reconcile with her. Just, just give her some time. And we prayed, and miraculously, that tube in her lungs, that, the breathing tube, they pull it out, and she, she somehow gets back to life. Uh, she's breathing again. She's healthy again. And now she's living in Fort Lee at 94 years old. She's, she's back somehow. It's unbelievable. I, I share with my mom all the time. Do you understand what just happened? Do you understand the miracle that just took place? This should not physically be possible with a 94-year-old grandmother. Praying with faith, with genuine faith. That goes a long way, doesn't it? So often we cry out to God, Father, save us, save me, save me, deliver me. Yet we cry out with no, no ounce of faith in our bones whatsoever. 
We just, we just shout out, thinking that the louder we shout, the, the, the more he's going to hear us. When we don't have a single faith in what we're praying about. Believing, genuine hoping that God will answer. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what Jesus is saying in verse 36 in Mark 14, 36. Jesus says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, he says. Did you ever start a prayer out that way? Father, I believe everything is possible for you because of you. Everything is possible for you, God. There is nothing impossible for you, God, we say. There's nothing impossible because you are sovereign, God. Because you are the one who's created this world. You're the one who determines all things, that's why. And so I'm going to pray with absolute faith and belief that Nothing is impossible. Not even things, not even, not even uh, things that, that, that go against the natural laws of science, even, even things like that, things that the world would say are impossible. I even believe, no, it's not even impossible for you, Father. Because that you're not you're not limited in any anything that way. You ever pray like that? You ever start out a prayer like that? Everything is possible for you. That's why I'm praying to you, Lord. And we pray this. We pray to the one who is able to deliver us from our own cup of suffering. And how often God does, doesn't he? How many times he does deliver. And he takes away that cup from us. Takes it away. Yet when even that's his plan to deliver us, even when that is his plan to take our cup of suffering away, he has us go through something very important, though, before he usually does it. Before he usually delivers us or takes it away, he, he has us go through something that is vital in prayer. And this is the second thing that we see in Jesus' prayer. In verse 36, again, it says, Abba, Father, he says, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. And then look what Jesus says in verse 36. Let's put that up. Yet, verse 36 in Mark, yet not what I will, but what you will, he says at the end, right? Yet not what I will, but what you will, he says. It's a kingdom prayer we've been praying, isn't it? Not my will, Father, not my kingdom stuff, but your kingdom, Father. Your purposes, not mine. Right? This is the surrender we're talking about here. Surrendering. That's the second thing we see in Jesus' prayer. Surrendering to God's will. Okay? Truly surrendering, letting go, praying and surrender to his will. It means letting go. Letting go of my plans, letting go of my plans, my, my, my control that I want to have in my life. I need to be in control. Some of us men, we're so much like this, aren't we? We need to be in control. We need to know exactly what's happening, plan everything out to the T. I need to know exactly what my future holds. God says, let it go. Let it go. Do you trust? Do you trust that he knows better? Surrender. Can you let it go? Can you give it up? I love what uh, my professor at Trinity, Dr. Eckloff, says about this. He says about the Christian life, he says, there is a lot of death in the Christian life, he says. Do you know that? There's a lot of death in the Christian life. We don't want to hear it, but it's true. He says there's death of dreams, death of pride, death of plans, death of security. Sometimes God quickly smites some such thing, and it is dead forever in an instant before we quite know what it hits us. Often enough, God wants us to look in the face of a dear thing to us and then send it off, let it go. He wants us to look at it and let it go. He wants us to pry our fingers off of it, the thing that is so important to us, so precious to us. He wants us to turn our backs to it and walk away from it. Lay that dear thing in, into his hands and leave it to an uncertain future. <laughs> oh, that wrestling is painful, isn't it? Right? Have you ever experienced that? God asking you to let something go. You feel it. You cannot. It's so precious. It's so painful. We can't imagine life being good without it. This is what this uh, the theologian Frederick uh, Buckner, he says uh, that God uh, in some way here becomes our beloved enemy. Ooh. <laughs> so sometimes God becomes our beloved enemy this way. Our enemy, why? Because before giving us everything, before he gives us everything, he demands of us everything, that's why. Before he gives you everything, all the blessings that you can imagine, he demands us of 
everything before giving us life. He demands our lives, ourselves, our wills, our treasure. God is our beloved enemy in that way to our sinful nature, isn't he? To our flesh. Because before he gives, he demands that we give it all. That's why. And this prayer of surrender, giving it all, is wrenching indeed, isn't it? It is painful. It is hard. Have you ever done that? Have you ever experienced that? But this is what Jesus is saying here. This is what Jesus is praying. Yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my dreams, not my hopes, Father, yours. I trust in your hopes and plans for me. I trust that. Do you trust that? Do you believe that? Do you genuinely believe that? That God has a plan for you. That he has an absolute perfect plan. That plan A we talked about, remember? That plan A for you. Regardless of what mistakes and, and sin that we go through. Surrendering. I trust you, Father, on the battlefield. That's a surrender over to God. That's what we're talking about when we say surrender our control over to the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be led by the Spirit, right? So many verses we, we, we studied in the past. Be led by the Spirit, right? So that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Be led by the Spirit, Spirit-filled living. That's what this is about, surrendering our control over to the Holy Spirit daily in our actions, in our decisions, in our choices. That's what it means, surrendering our will. Father, I, I trust you. Father, Holy Spirit, lead me. I'll surrender my will over to you today. I'll surrender my pride over to you. Lead me today. I'll, I'll follow. I'll trust. That's what Jesus is doing, surrendering. Here's the final thing that we learn from Jesus. <laughs> Here's the final thing we learn uh, about his prayer, that we are to keep on praying, keep on praying until it's done. Verse 37, he said, we see this uh, in verse 37, right? He says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? It, 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 it says right here, Jesus has been praying for an hour straight here. It's a long time to pray, isn't it? He's been praying for one hour, and he's praying, and he comes back. Two more times he comes to pray. He probably prayed for more than three hours total that night. In prayer, this agonizing prayer. Well, what's interesting to me is there's a subtle change in Jesus' prayer when he goes from the first time to pray and to the second time. It shows us in Matthew. Now, now we're going to see Matthew 26 again, where we actually studied last week. Okay? Look at the first time that Jesus goes to pray. In Matthew 26, verse 39, we're going to put that up there on the screen. And Jesus goes a little further, falls on his face to the ground, and he prays. He says, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, he says. Right? Verse 39 here. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Right? He says. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Okay? But then he says in Matthew 26, verse 42. Let's go to verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed. He says, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. You see the subtle shift here? Let's go back to verse 39. He says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Verse 42 says here, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. You see what's going on here? Jesus is wrestling, isn't he, through this prayer. He's wrestling, he's, but he's progressing. He's progressing, isn't he? He's understanding more and more the Father's plan. If it is not possible then, if this is the only way, if I am to be the way, then may your will be done still. That doesn't waver, does it? That remains the same in all three of his prayers here. He never wavers once from submitting to his will. Okay? See the progression in his prayer? See how his heart lets go? You know? and our hearts are so stubborn, isn't it? We're so strong and stubborn in our hearts. We, we, we don't want to let go. We keep saying, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. That's what we keep on praying in our prayers, right? Father, if it's possible, get it away. Rid this uh, you know, thing from my life. Get this hardship away. If it is possible and you, it is possible with you, just get it away, we say. But we don't ever pray the second kind of prayer Jesus says. If it is not possible, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done, right? Isn't that true? Do we ever pray that kind of prayer? 
Father, if it is not possible for me to, to not endure this hardship and suffering, if I must go through this suffering and trial and tribulation, then still, Father, as it be, may your will be done. Nevertheless, may your will still be done in my life. Even if I have to go through this. Even if I have to go through this heart. Even if I'm struggling and still trying to find a job for, for the past two years it's been. I'm still struggling. If it, is still, if, it is, if it is not possible still then, Father, may your will be done. If my, if my loved one is still going to be sick and, 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 and she's still going to go through cancer and, and, and if it is not possible for it to be taken away, may your will be done, Father. May your will still be done. It's understanding his will. It's coming into terms with his will. It's being in line with his will, church. It's surrendering over to his will. Submission, that's a key here. ever moving so slowly to surrender, to submission. Because that's where the battle is fought here. Right? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. I want to put this verse up. Look at what it says here. The author of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, what he writes. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard... Because of his reverent submission. See that, church? It says right here, in the days of Jesus' life on earth, especially the last days. We're talking about here, even in our passage in Mark and Matthew. Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane. He offers prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. Tears of sweat and blood here to the one who could save him from this death. And he was heard, it says. Why? Because of Christ's Reverent submission, that's why. Reverent submission. That's surrender, church. That's submission, letting go of his will to God's will. That's a turning point of this prayer right here. I believe, I believe it. This is the turning point of Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane. When he, when, when, when he submits his will over to God and says, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, Father, may your will be done. That's when victory, I believe, is won, church. Victory is won here in submission. Submission here is the key, then, to prayer. Submission is the key to surrender when we go to the battlefield. To surrender when we go to the battlefield. Our biggest struggle, I think, is that when we pray. I think that's the biggest struggle. It's not so much uh, not knowing what to pray or, or what, to, what to say, what not. Our, our biggest struggle is, is, to, is so hard to give up our control. It's so hard to give up our dreams. It's so hard to give up uh, my plans and desires and wishes for my life. This is what I want, God. This is what I need. And so although we go out to the battlefield, although we're out there on the battlefield to pray and, and, and to, to do this battle, if we're not surrendering our will over to God in reverent submission, we're not experiencing this victory, are we? We're not experiencing this victory that is here, that God is, is waiting for us to experience here in prayer. We wonder why. We wonder why we're not victorious in prayer here in our life. Because we're failing to persist in prayer to the point of true submission, that's why. True submission in prayer. I'll close off with, with this. There's, there's five things, I believe, that happen when, when, when we fail to submit in prayer. Five things that happen, hear me out. When we fail to submit to God in prayer, this is what happens. First, you remain at odds with God. Okay? You remain at odds with Him. If you're at odds with God, many of you are not liking this message here. Many of you are not liking what you're hearing here. Because you're at odds with Him. You have some specific things in your life that you don't want, and you're saying, God, change this in my life. Change this. Get rid of it. Get me in a different spot in my life. Do a different thing. Fix this now, we're saying. And He's not fixing it, and you're angry about it. He's not fixing you. He's not letting it go. He's not taking this cup away from you. And you are angry about it. So secondly, when you're at odds with God and you're angry with him, you're failing to see his purposes then. See? You're failing to see his purposes, right? That God has a purpose in that very difficult thing in your life. There's a purpose, a reason why he's brought this maybe trial or test into your life. 
to grow you, right? Even when it's not something that you would have chosen, if you submit to him, God's going to bring something good out of it. But if you're not submitting to him, you're not seeing this, right? You're not seeing this purpose. Completely oblivious. I, can't, I don't know why I have to go through this, we say. I don't get it. And so the third thing that happens is you go around walking around, you're upset and angry because you're not in submission to God. You're walking around, you're just a, you're just a mean person, okay? You're an angry person. You're just going around and complaining. Oh, God, this, oh, all these people. You're, you're just an angry person. He's not doing the thing you want. You're out with them. And, and the most irritating thing is when, when people are saying, can't you see what God's doing in your life? Can't you see what, how God's trying to work? And it drives you crazy, right? You want to punch that person in the face. Shut your mouth. I don't want to hear that, we say, right? I don't want to hear that. You can't just see what God, nonsense, we say. All you want to do is just say, you know what, just stop. And you can't see it because you're not submitting to God in prayer. You're at odds with them. So the fourth thing is when you're not seeing what he's doing, when you're not seeing what God's purpose is, your view of God, it becomes skewed. Your view of him actually becomes skewed, and that's how people get messed up ideas about God, right? We think that he's some vindictive God, some, some kind of dictator, some kind of, some kind of uh, person who wants to just make your lives miserable. That's, that's the messed up views that we have of God. Right? You want to understand what it's like when you're fighting him. You're, you're fighting him instead of submitting to him, and then your fellowship with him is hindered. And so if you don't know what God is like, some of you here, you don't know what God is like really. You have this distorted view of who God is, and you don't want to surely spend any time with him, right? Who'd want to spend a time with some kind of tyrant, dictator God? Nobody does. So, so you choose, hey, you know what? I don't want to spend any time with him. Some of us think, yeah, you know what? Maybe I should have a, a, a quiet time. Maybe I should spend some time in, in reading his word and prayer. And maybe I should do daily personal worships. Eh, maybe it's probably a good thing. But, but you don't. You're going to say, you know, I'll do it next week. But you never do. Huh. I'll do it this week. This is the week I'm going to start. This is the week I'm going to commit. Never happens. Why? You know why you never do that? Because your fellowship with God is hindered, that's why. Because <laughs> your fellowship with God is hindered, because your view of God is blocked, because you're at odds with him. And you won't submit to him in regard to a specific situation, whatever it is in your life. You're, gonna, you're refusing to submit. You're constantly at odds, odds with him. And so here's a final fallout here. Here's the last and final fallout. <laughs> with all this going on, you're angry, you're bitter, you're upset, you're fighting. Against it. Our access to God's grace then becomes hindered. His grace that he's just waiting to pour on on your life. That access to it, it's hindered. Hebrews 12, 15 talks about that. It talks about people going through these trials because they don't submit to God and then, and then they fall short of the grace of God, right? The grace of God is all this, all this wonderful blessing, all the joy that he wants to give to you in the midst of your difficult situation. He wants to help you, church. He wants to be there to give you strength. He wants to support you, but you, if you're fighting him, if you're resisting him, you're not going to experience it, all, that, all that joy that he's, he's waiting to give to you, right? You won't experience it. And the result of it then, what? It's simple. It's bitterness. It's just bitterness, okay? It's people all over this world who are just angry and bitter. They're just angry and bitter people because they're not living in submission to God. That's why. Because they're not living in submission to God. Can't you see, church? It's about surrender here, right? It's about surrender. Surrender on the battlefield. Okay? Listen up, focus here. It's about surrender. Okay? We think that on the battlefield, we think that when we go into this battlefield, all of, you know, we think of all these uh, analogies, we've seen so many war movies and whatnot, we think it's all about aggression, about fighting, attacking, prepare yourselves for battle, come on, let's get this enemy, and, and counterattack and all this stuff. When in fact, what's the most important thing on this battlefield is not attack and, and all this just angst, it's actually surrender here, see? It's actually surrendering, it's an opposite when we go on the battlefield. It's about surrendering over to God, surrendering our will over to him. As Jesus says, not as I will, but as you will, Father. And with this surrender, we see what happens through Jesus' prayer in verse 41 as we close here. Returning the third time, he says to them in Mark chapter 14, verse 41, he says, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer, he says. 
That's victory, church. That's victory right there. Jesus is victorious right here. Yes, we said ultimately victory comes at the cross. We know that. But right here, I believe the battle is first won in prayer. Do you believe that, church? Right here in the prayer of Gethsemane, all the angst, the wrestling that Jesus is going through, the battle is won on the battlefield of prayer here. And that's what Jesus shows us. That's what he shows us. So many of us are going through a lot of struggles. I know that, right? Attacks are coming. They have come in your life. I, I, I get that. And there's these challenges and, and all these hardships. Jesus is teaching us today, church, how we're to pray in those times. He's teaching us what we must do. So let's go to the Father. Just ask for help, the first thing. Yeah? Go to him for deliverance, right? Ask for help, for some answer, for comfort. But you got to do it in, 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 in a way we, we surrender our will over to him, right? We surrender our will over to him. And the third thing is we just have to be persistent, persistent over and over again until he answers. And I promise you, he will answer you. He always has. He always will. I promise you that. So are you submitting? Are we ready to submit over to him in prayer? Are you, are you ready to submit? Have you, have you ever tried that? I challenge you. As especially Lent starts here, especially as Hassanja, the 40 days of Lent starts tomorrow morning at a church. I challenge you, try it. Put God to the test here. Try and see what happens if you, for the first time in your life, that you surrender your will over to God. Surrender your, your life over them. Surrender your control over them. See what happens. I, I, I implore you. I exhort you to try it. And I, I promise you something's going to happen. Whether you like it or not, something will happen. Stop fighting, church. Stop resisting. Surrender as Jesus did. He surrendered to God's will. He surrendered to God's authority. And he was victorious in the end through prayer, church. I pray all of us, especially during this season of Lent, that we'll go to God in prayer. We'll surrender over to him on the battlefield. And through surrender, through surrender, submitting, may we experience a victory that awaits us in prayer. Let's go to him. Let's go to God. And it's, for your, it's because of your blood. Nothing could attain for our sin but your blood. Thank you for being our hope and peace and for being our righteousness. And thank you for setting the example and showing us today how we are to pray. Uh, showing us when trials and attacks come our way, what we must do, Father. Thank you, Father, for reminding us that we're to go to you, go to the Father for deliverance, to plead for deliverance, for your help. But in doing so, by surrendering our will to you and continuing to be persistent in that, Father, until you answer. Father, would you help us to submit today as we go out into the battlefield? It's more than just being ready for attack and uh, being ready to go into war with saying, Father, it's first surrendering on the battlefield and surrendering our will over to you. Help us to do that this week. Help us, Father, to trust in your plan for our life. To know that you are a good God, a loving God, a merciful God, a God that wants to give us a hope and a future, not to harm us, but to prosper us. Help us to trust that, that even with that, we might have to go through some trials and, and challenges. Well, we're going to have to go through our own cup of suffering. But may we never doubt and may we never waver in saying that, Father, may your will, not my will, not what I will, but what you will, may that be done, Father. May your will be done in our lives. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.